Uh, hey, uh, my name is Derek Baird. Uh, I've been in the Army for a while. Uh, I'm a field artillery officer by trade. Um, so I have a pretty unique experience in the Army. Again, three deployments, uh, two Iraq, one Afghanistan. That's not the unique part. The unique part is I spent about three years in NATO. Uh, I did uh, much at the first German Netherlands Corps. Uh, so I've done targeting from the battalion all the way up to the NATO Corps Joint Task Force level. So I've got a pretty unique experience with that and then spent two, so the recidivism rate is high at the National Training Center, right? So it's like prison, right? So you go there, you go back, right? So uh, I was uh, there from 08 to 10 as a post-battery command for two years and then post-battalion command. So I've seen the coin fight and then uh, large-scale combat operations fight and then fought that fight, the LISCO and the coin fight uh, as, a, uh, as a young officer, then as a battalion commander, then took all those lessons learned and brought it to JMRC and, you know, and for our JMRC compadre, we jacked him up pretty good because of all the lessons learned we learned at NTC, pretty with the urban fight. I say all that because uh, because of the, the experience I've had have really helped shape what we do, uh, I think, for the Army and LISCO. So that, I just wanted to show a quick video of, uh, so everybody's been to Razish, I think, right? Who has not yet been to Razish? I think everybody has, just about. So this is the, this is the fight for Razish, the beginning of it. So you see a little bit of obscuration as it goes through. This is a strong point right here. You'll see a little bit of that. You'll know, see a, an infantry unit attacking Razish for about 45 seconds. And so as you do that, just kind of keep that in mind of, what we can do with fires to help our infantry brothers and sisters and our armor folks as they, you know, go into a season objective or multiple objectives in urban terrain. So if we could just run the uh, video real quick, if you don't mind. So you see obscuration right here going in. You see a lot of blinky lights because we didn't do suppression. So we didn't do any HE suppression whatsoever. So a lot of blinky lights, that means the uh, vehicles are destroyed, right? A little bit more obscuration here, so localized. My commentary. So you see right here, you got a unit that's attacking in to Razish. What we don't see is a lot of combined arms maneuvers, just, just leading with her chin, right? So this is the initial stage. So you see tanks Bradley stacked up, ready to go and penetrate. So that's that's the initial stages of the fight for Azish. So if we just go to the first slide there real quick. While we're waiting, I'll tell a fun joke. What's the, uh, what do Winnie the Pooh and Alexander the Great have in common? Their middle name, all right. I'll be here all day, I'll be here all day. All right, the, right? <laughs> Somebody all like, I didn't get it, the, all right. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, now we're engaged. All right. Hey, look, so this is uh, one of the slides that we use for AARs. I use this quite a bit to brief uh, senior leaders in the Army and, and units before they come to the come to the National Training Center. And uh, if you haven't, I'll, I'll plug it right now. Talk about this quite a bit uh, extensively in a podcast that uh, the Wolf team does, uh, the field artillery trainers at the National Training Center. It's the uh, NTC Fireside Chat published by the King of Battle podcast. Uh, you find all Google, um, Apple Auto, or Apple Play, and uh, Spotify. Uh, one of them I talked with fires to support a combined arms maneuver with a lot of the 07s. And a 07 at the National Training Center is a former battalion commander, right? And so we talked a lot about fires and support of combined arms maneuver. And half of that was talking about the urban terrain or the urban environment. So if you're interested in listening to that, what the discussion is with maneuver, armor, sustainment, uh, communications in uh, Go 7. Uh, if you want to be interested in hearing about that, you can look them up on the King of Battle podcast, NTC Fireside Chat. It's a little bit more in depth. All right, so taking a look at this in my uh, anecdotally, I fought this fight in 2019 as a battalion commander. We, uh, you know, so 2008, 2010 there as an OC, a lot of coin fight. You try to put fires inside the city. It's very difficult to do. Uh, a lot of restrictions, right? You're talking about CD constantly. You're talking about these like, who's ever had to put together a slide packet for a field artillery mission or a fires mission? Uh, in real life or in training. Has anybody ever done that before? They try to put fires inside a, inside a city. It's a lot. And it may take two or three days for that approval to come back because the target engagement authority is echelons above reality. Okay, so in 2000, fast forward to 2019, we're doing a LISCO fight. We fought this fight west to east. You know, so there's east to west fight, west to east. We did west to east. Uh, and we identified a bunch of uh, strong points, uh, command and control nodes, main command posts inside the city. Uh, we identified uh, radar, uh, counterfire radar, air defense radar, air defense systems. So we had a good picture 
and Alex uh, was uh, our EW guy, right? So as a fire support coordinator in the brigade, as a planner, we identify a lot of these things early and often, all right? So three years ago, I still had to do targeting packets at the brigade level in a Lisco fight. And, and most of us know in the brigade, you know, time is, time is, is of essence, right? We're, we're going to attack a, a hostile force in an urban environment or any objective really, right? And so I had to put together CDE packets. We had to do all these things to attack one, one single target that we were only allowed to attack here on the outskirts of town. All right, so that was it. And so my AR comment back to the National Training Center is we shouldn't do this, this is Lisco. We should be able to provide fires in the middle of a city and fight this fight based off of these consider a lot of these considerations down here that I'll get to in a minute. And then in uh, 2020, uh, Post Battalion Command showed up to the National Training Center and we worked with the ghost team with the rest of the brigade folks and the uh, 52nd ID, i.e. the NTC Ops Group. And we really made this a more permissive fight for a division and really for a brigade. All right, so what we tell people nowadays is there's only really two big restrictions that we, we provide for, uh, for fires inside of urban terrain or urban environment. No cluster munitions, anybody know why? Dud No cluster munitions, right? Does anybody know why? Dud rate. Dud rate. And what else? The receiver damage of the cluster ammunition that this doesn't explode. That's right. And what else? The auto accords. Where's my Canadians? We should know this, right? CCW. All right. The auto accords, right? Does anybody know what the auto accords are? Well, like a lot of nations sign it? It's uh, against anti personal landmines. That's right. Well, that and then uh, and cluster munitions as well, right? So we, we, we're not really signatories of it, but we do follow it. Everybody's tracking that, right? We, we do follow that. Uh, but, uh, and then we also use, we looked at what is the use of law of armed conflict, ROE, rules of engagement, distinction, proportionality, military necessity. So what we did is instead of putting it on uh, echelons above reality for a target engagement authority, what we've now done at the, at the National Training Center is we've given that authority level to the brigade commander and, and his or her designated representative, either the FISC cord or the brigade three or the XO, right? So that, that's what we're coaching units as they come through the National Training Center. And for a really good reason, right? This is a fight that is very difficult, very dynamic in nature. It's very difficult to provide as a fire, as a fire support coordinator at the brigade level or brigade commander, any of you as a brigade planner, to really, yeah, I can, I can plan this. I can be very deliberate with my planning, but in a dynamic fight, conditions change constantly, constantly from minute to minute, hour to hour, to day to day. And so to restrict a unit really takes away the ability of a unit to seize terrain, to seize an objective, to fight through the urban terrain, right? Uh, so, so there's that. So we took a look at all that initially on how do we make it more permissive using law of armed conflict, ROE, uh, proportionality, distinction, military necessity, all those things we talk about uh, in the legal ease sense and then in targeting, all right? So for brigade planners, first thing we think about in fires, what, what is the first thing we should really think about? Like we're, we're about to plan to go into a fire. So I'm asking a lot of questions for the group because I think it's a good back and forth here. What, what should be the first thing? I'm about to plan fires. What should I think about first? What am I trying to? The desired effect. Right. All right, that's absolutely fantastic. What else? The mission. The mission. Commander's intent. Commander's intent, right? Okay. It's really, and, and all those are great. The big thing is, and you have to hit the nail on the head, what is the brigade commander's intent for fires? Right? That is what sets us up for success. Right? What is the commander's intent for fires? And if this court is worth their weight in salt, should be able to provide that recommendation. And he and the he or she and the, and the brigade commander should have this discussion early and often. And, the, and then with the FSO, plan that with the brigade. With the brigade. All right. So we take the commander's intent for fires and we build out essential fire support tasks, right? Does anybody, does anybody know what an essential fire support task is? Anybody? I, I'm just asking anybody. Raise your hand. Who knows? And point someone out. What, what is that? Anybody? Uh, an ESFP is um, a critical task that the commander directs uh, to apply effects against, and ideally you're going to brief both uh, kinetic effects and non-kinetic effects against every single EFST in order to achieve your mission. Okay, good. You got to do it. You got to do it, right? It's it's it is the task that the the commander wants to, that will help him achieve the mission, right? And so doctrinally, you have an EFST by phase. That's the that's sort of the science of it. I would say the art of it is it's 
you got to take a look at close and deep because there's a close fight and there's a deep fight that's somewhere out here, whether that's a uh, counter battery, whether it's uh, against the attack in the reserve force, uh, reinforcements, those kinds of things, right? Or it could be this is your close fight and you can see where, you know, the, the brigade has uh, divvied this out in sectors. You know, this could be a close fight. This potentially, you know, especially in a dense, large urban terrain, could be your deep fight, depending on what that fight looks like, right? I mean, this is Razish. It's not L.A. or New York, right? Razish, this is very close for all of it. Uh, but in New York, you know, this could be a close fight. This could potentially be your deep fight. So it makes sense that we talked about earlier in the offensive terrain, offensive fight and terrain. So anyway, we start with the, the commander's intent for fires, and then we break it down to essential fire support tasks. So something similar to this. And then we look at the considerations for the MDMP, the military decision-making process, on how do we apply those fires to the seven steps of the MDMP. And then the next day after we do that, the next is how do we apply that to targeting? Right. And so we take the essential fire support tasks, you know, and do the uh, ATO cycle is generally what the uh, uh, our our um, brigade level uh, targeting process and really division of core. Same air Ours, tasking order. Yeah, air task order. Thank you. Yep. So a ATO air tasking order. Right. It's an Air Force term. So we get into that. So it helps us as we. Uh, uh, look for resources for the decide, detect, deliver, and assess methodology for targeting. So we take the EFST, all right, and then we combine that with what we're trying to do with the commander's intent for fires and what we're trying to do inside the city. And while I'll just use Razish as an example. So if I say Razish, this is the fight that we normally see here at the National Training Center. So then some of the considerations, how do we maintain constant pressure with fires, right? What does that look like to get into a city? So to fight into a city, what do you normally have to do to actually get into a city? What do you have to normally do? You have to breach, right? Whether you have to breach, whether it's a, an infiltration, because you're going to breach something, right? So if it's infiltration, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit smaller, uh, probably a little bit more stealthy, you know, so less less of a social drill. But what we often see is, you know, some sort of a, a, a you saw it up here, but some sort of breaching obstacle up here, somewhere in the south, potentially. Uh, our 11th ACR buddy is around here somewhere. I think maybe not, but he could he could tell you that the defense in the uh, urban terrain has improved over the past two years with uh, John's uh, wealth of knowledge there to help out the NTC. So, so quick on the yes, sir. So we had talk, we talked a lot about tempo, right? We've been yep. talking about that and think tempo and keeping the pressure on. You don't necessarily keep it go 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 and going. Tempo is not speed, right? But tempo is your cadence, right? And keeping that pressure on. So can you talk that piece with the pressure yes, sir. fires? Absolutely. You can talk about that as part of, you can play that with your maneuver tempo yes, sir. to keep your enemy. Yes, sir. So this, uh, this uh, slide is sort of an amalgamation of several slides. So we kind of put it together. So it's not just uh, one unit. Here's what I'll tell you. First of all, uh, we consider risk before I get to tempo. We consider risk right now. Uh, we are trying to still get rid of the coin mentality uh, and, and not provide any fires whatsoever inside an urban environment. Right. So try and get rid of that. That mindset still still uh, is in the in the army's uh, paradigm. We're trying to change that. So for tempo. All right. So this is a uh, this is a unit uh, that uh, started. You can tell. So 1200. Uh, they, they executed uh, a couple of, uh, you can see rockets, mortar, cannon. Right here, you can see a lot of uh, rocket. You had some cannon, and you had some uh, cast strikes right off the bat on known uh, defensive structures and known uh, main command posts, right? So they built a fire support plan. You can see a lot of this fire support plan here. Some of this is, uh, this is all planned targets right here. We didn't put in a dynamic. There's a lot of dynamic we didn't put in here, but all these are planned targets here and this is based off targeting um you know for 72 hours prior to this execution prior to this 1200 right here so tempo doesn't start with the physical aspect so tempo started with this organization with their targeting process and their planning process right and then that that tempo and if you look at that in 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 terms of time and space they knew that they were backed up on a time where they were going to get first rounds downrange so 1200 that that correlated with uh the scouts held and so with that we had isr a bunch of stuff overhead whether it's uh uav uas uh, EW assets, we had growlers on station for electronic defense, you know, all these things that allowed us to provide this tempo throughout the day and into the night where we were able to provide minus some cast because you see just cast is just, uh, you know, a little bit of a play here in the joint realm for obvious reasons, right? Because they're fighting another fight. But throughout this, the tempo 
all the resources that, that, that the uh, brigade brought to bear allowed them to have this, where they put constant pressure over a 24 hour period, really sort of stopped right here at 1400. But this is when uh, most of the 802nd that's in the city, 802nd uh, BTG, Brigade Tactical Group, and the BFB, the, the Belisavar Freedom Brigade, were in this fight here, um, the Denovians, if you will. Uh, so uh, we put constant pressure for an over 24 hour period. This is the first time I've seen that in two years at the National Training Center. Most organizations, when do you think that you can expect to see the initial pressure with fires? When do you when do you think that's going to occur for most units? At the breach, right? So at the breach. So we have done nothing, right? So we're still planning out here. You know, then we could have probably done some fires here initially. You know, 12, 24, 36 hours even prior to this. But really, we we really fired about this is when we started breaching right here, twenty four hours prior to LD, which is really great for the main body LD. First time I've ever seen that. So what this constant pressure allows what to happen, do you think, in this city? 24 hours prior to execution. Fatigue, right? Uh, disorientation of the enemy, they don't know what's coming, when it's coming. Disruption, right? Yeah. Destruction in some areas, main command posts, we're disrupting nodes, the supply chain, right? So this is the first time we've seen that. This is the first time that we actually had a really good positive comment from the BTG commander that came to the AR after this and said, well, when they did this, 24 hours of constant pressure with fires in some form or fashion, and, and uh, Alex will talk about the electronic piece here in a little bit, but that was included in this, it was that constant pressure, specifically in some of these strong pointed areas, caused mass confusion, caused disruption, like we just talked about, and so allowed uh, uh, the uh, BT or the brigade to provide a disruptive effect in town. And you can see we talk about and, you know, it eventually was to neutralize. Right. So that that allowed us to have these effects early. So units said don't do that. So planners, if we don't plan early for, for fires, what we're really doing is allowing the enemy to have constant uh, upgrades to the defense. Right. Refinements constant uh, ability to surveil you and recon. And then three, continue to upgrade their defensive posture. Go ahead. Sorry. The first one being neutralized, do you, do you think with that, did they achieve that or did they achieve and maybe a different effect? But still enabled. No, this was absolute. Uh, so for this fight and the and the two that we've seen that actually use fires early and often to maintain constant pressure, achieve neutralization, right? And so uh, we were able to do that not only in the city but with uh, counter battery as well. So it was really great. So so a couple of these things they're allowed to do. Uh, again, it's putting that constant pressure over time and space, all right. If you look, a lot of this, and we talk about pressure a lot, but with Canon initially, you know, a couple of missions here, a couple, it's not a lot of missions, wasn't a lot, until about zero two. When do you think, what do you think happened here? They started to move from their forming up point to get into position. Say again? They started to move uncoiled from their forming up point to get into position. Right, go from a, you know, assault position to attack position, right? What else? And the facts start. Then you need to uh, look at more objectives that the maneuver is to... Right, exactly, right? So the observer plan. So the next piece of our planning is your observer plan, right? So uh, how do we, again, you, you look at this, we were able to use electronic uh, attack, if you will, or electronic surveillance, overhead ISR, uh, some OPs early with recon. But over time, you can see from 1200 in a period of darkness, we started to see in a spike around 2300 because our observer plan became our observer plan. And by that, I mean, we had fire supporters in place, the Mark One eyeball, right? The all weather platform is, is someone on a hill with a digital or binocular, right? Uh, we had, uh, you know, we had some more ISR up here. We had a lot, we brought a lot more uh, things and resources to bear to do combined arms maneuver. But this is where we really started to shape because we could see them better, right? Because our observer plan. So again, as, a, as a, we planned for the urban fight, we saw this in a lot of the uh, the offensive and defensive uh, uh, considerations. And then uh, in uh, SARS, um, her brief at lunch, she talked about, and, you know, what, what do we have for the Mark One eyeball or ISR or any type of observer platform? You, know, you can see that right here. So it all started coming together. And then we started seeing a lot of bigger spike in mortars, straight HE, not indirect fire. Again, if you, if you, if you remember the uh, we talked about earlier is we do not put a restriction on the type of HE round except for cluster munitions like DPICM. So straight HE is fine.
right? Now, the consideration is PGM, you know, and we'll get to that here in a minute. So again, as we talk about time and, and space and tempo, we talk about bringing uh, what we had to bring to bear early, to start disrupting early. And then once we got our fire supporters in place and we got other assets from the division in place, we were able to get a much more refined targeting for dynamic strikes and brought more things to bear, more resources to bear for the organic assets. Go ahead. Does this account for your the friendly and enemies counter fire missions? And what is that for just opposed to the losses? Oh, no, that's really a great question. No, so this is all, so we, this does not include the counter battery missions. This is straight uh, all HE, you know, inside the, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, th these, this right here is just based off of the, the fire missions that were inside the urban terrain. With that being said, uh, the division handled for this particular fight in this particular phase in, in a series of time, the division handled the counter fire. Uh, from, uh, I want to say, from midnight to about 1600, uh, you know, to allow the, this organization, this brigade, to organically provide fires in the close fight. So you were talking about at 23 kind of having the sensor like on station. Yeah. From, for those 11 hours prior, uh, did you, do you see a lot of uh, unobserved fires from organizations? Because I know the risk and Sure. So we got to be careful with unobserved, right? So uh, what is truly unobserved, right? And so uh, we use a lot of electronic, you know, whether it's a uh, SIGINT, ELINT, you, you, you name it, INT. And depending on the type of uh, line of bearing you get from an electronic platform, SIGINT, SPACE, uh, depending on that, you can either cross queue to verify what's there or if it's a good space, 10 digit grid, mensurate and shoot it. So we allow them, we, we, that's very permissive. We allow folks to do that. Uh, so from the target acquisition uh, standpoint, Prior to this, we had the Mark One eyeball and other assets. Uh, here, we had some assets up front from the division. We had mostly organic assets. Some got shot down, right? You know, so there's a, an enemy play in this. You know, so you can see some of that where we we had some initial success here. Enemy had some success, and we had greater success. We started bringing more things to bear, more target acquisition over a command and control system down to attack delivery platform. Uh, so you can see this, and but this spike also meant that. Our strikers, whether our 120s is predominant, 120s uh, were able to fire into the city based off their observer platform, right? And so, somebody else have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I'm not sure if you're at liberty to discuss this, but with the mortars, how long does it take from the first, on average, a good mortar team from first call to fire to the last round impacting? That's great. Okay, so that's great. Uh, I'll kind of, kind of go big picture. On average, sensor to shooter uh, for a variety of reasons, and I can you, I, I can talk about it after this. So I don't bore everybody. Uh, the uh, sensor to shooter is on average twenty minutes. That, that's generally for cannons, right? <coughs> Mortars, it's much more reactive, right, and so much quicker and very very dynamic. So, as you can see, the reason why the strikers you won because they've got, you know, per battalion you got ten. 10 120 millimeter, millimeter mortar tube. So it's essentially two batteries worth of indirect fire inside a Stryker battalion, per battalion, by the way. Right, so you see a lot more uh, 120s here because they are more permissive. And I say that because they're a lot more responsive to that organic unit. Now, with that being said, we, I'll talk about this here now is, uh, we talk about tempo. Part of our tempo also means graphic control measures. Talk to it so this all comes together, right? It's all circular. So it all comes together. So you talk about graphic control measures. Again, where's the coordinated fire line? Don't know. Where's our CFL? Depends on where they put it, right? You've got converging forces. So where's the restricted fire line? What does that look like? Who controls what piece of terrain for clearance of fires? So all this is has to be considered in the planning process. Not just the planning process, but after we do planning, what's the next thing we do before we attack? Rehearse, Rehearse right? Okay, so how well do you think we are? I mean, anybody, are we good at rehearsals? But what, do you, what do they tend to be? Back briefs, right? So as we go through this, again, there's a planning phase and there's a rehearsal phase to this. And so through that, so kind of like you're getting after is, do we have the right common graphics? And does everybody have it? Do the aviators have it? And the aviators, I mean, not just a fixed wing, but a rotary wing, right? Do our drone pilots have it? All right. Do, does the trooper on the ground have it? You know, the Joe, the digger, the PAX, right? All these folks, do they have, do they have the same common operating picture on the ground to clear fires? Very difficult in train like this, right? So again, things to consider as we look at maintaining constant pressure of the fires, all those have to be considered in the planning process. And it's got to be permissive and flexible, right? 
Um, the one challenge with artillery, and I'll tell you from an artillery officer who's done this for a long time, is artillery and fires is typically a very inflexible organization, right? Right, you gotta bring all your resources together, we're gonna attack at, you know, zero six, zero eight, whatever it is, and then what happens? Either the enemy has a vote and you attack later, or, or you've infiltrated, or someone's got a good bead on, okay, I'm not gonna have, I don't, you know, a bypass for the obstacle, so I can blow through the obstacle, or I can do things earlier because I'm prepared early, and what does that do to your plan? Changes it. So for the planners in the room, you've gotta look at what decision points what things can I have in place to be flexible in my fires? All right, so planners, I highly recommend that. And if you're a fires planner, I absolutely recommend that. Understand what that looks like and have that pipeline up to your higher headquarters, specifically if it's a division or higher level resource that you need to bring to bear and you may have to change and be more flexible with it. Uh, how do we balance a close and deep fight? For planners, again, we talk about the urban environment. What is the, you know, if you look at uh, 3-96, the brigade's uh, manual, the new Bible they came out with, what, April? May this year, so sometime in 2022. You know, what's the brigade's deep fight look like? You know, and where is that in an urban terrain or an urban environment? You know, in Razish, you know, for typically this is the close fight. You can range everything from uh, from outside the city. You don't need to bring your howitzers in. You know, you, you can if you want. I mean, tactically, it's you know, it's a tactical decision a brigade or battalion commander will make. We're not going to discuss that here. But you know, so for this, the deep fight is it? You know, somewhere out here. Uh, and that's usually with cast, tack aviation, and uh, some cannon, uh, you know, so you can attrit the reinforcing force, right? Because what happens when you seize key terrain or an objective? What, what is Amy trying to do? Take it back. Take it back, right? So with fires, you got to balance that. So for brigade planners, everybody wants everything all at the same time, everywhere at the same time, right? It's like that movie, everything, everywhere, all at once, whatever, everything, everywhere, all at once, you know what I'm talking about? Michelle, yeah, nobody? Really? Great movie, you should watch it, it's fantastic. Uh, but everybody wants everything, and uh, fires organically, and division resources are finite resources, and unless you are the uh, priority effort, you're probably not gonna get a lot of division resources. You know, so attacking it into this uh, urban environment, or a large urban environment like LA, you know, Kiev, you name it, right? You might not, every, a brigade, or multiple brigades might be fighting in a small terrain, uh, and so you got to look at prioritization of effort because you may not be that. And so how do you provide fires for that? And a lot of it will be organically. And that's why we talk about this with using HE. We, I think uh, uh, you know, we talked about sort of making HE great, right? Like bringing it back, bringing the king of battle back into the urban terrain. All right, then we talked about this quite a bit. Uh, and I'll talk about this next, or at the last, is risk versus reward. And I know we talked about this uh, at the lunch break and I talked about this last night over, over some beers, is risk versus reward. So as we look at targeting and planning and the execution of fires inside an urban environment, looking at rules of engagement, law of armed conflict, proportionality, distinction, military necessity, all those things still exist within large scale combat operations, but the target engagement authority has changed, right? The level of CDE, the collateral damage estimation changes, or you just don't do it. Right, because in, in deliberate planning, I would say it's probably a good thing to do just to look at the risk associated. Again, CD is a risk management tool. It's not a decision tool. So make sure everybody's tracking that. Everybody's tracking that, right? Like CD is just a risk tool that helps and aids in decision, but it's not the decision tool, all right? So when we look at collateral damage, we gotta take a look at, you know, what's the structure look like? What does all that look like? And that's great for deliberate planning. What does that look like for dynamic strikes, right? And if I'm in a fight and it's me versus them, it's not gonna be me, it's gonna be them, right? And so if you remember that video I showed, there's that big, big uh, strong pointed building, right? And uh, you know, what, what happens do you think typically when, when we go into uh, Razish, we got a couple objectives, you know, uh, Black Horse, 802nd, they don't strong point the entire city. They've got some good like mobile defense inside, but they've really got a couple strong pointed areas. What are some things that we think as a brigade that we can do prior to and during a fight to plan for and execute as brigade planners? What do we think with fires? Specifically indirect fires to help with, uh, you know, destroying a, a main command post or um, or strong point. Pre-planned targets. Pre-planned targets, right? Good fire support plan that helps out with that, right? What else? Creeping garage during the breach. Say again? A creeping garage during the breach. I mean, I guess you could. It just depends on... Um, 
Yeah, it depends on the fire support plan. And by that, I think you mean like, like if I'm, just to make sure I got this right, like, hey, I'm doing suppression obscuration up here with indirect fires. I may also be putting in depth, you know, some mortars in here somewhere to maybe like. Uh, uh, could you make garages where it moves forward and take some money in front of your force that they need? Yeah, for sure. Like if you're going block to block. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so if you're going block to block, right? If you're going block to block and it gets uh, and that terrain gets a little bit more unmanageable because the enemy's in there, take a step back, right? Re uh, revisit or uh, you know take a look again at, uh, at what your fires plan looks like and your maneuver versus your maneuver plan and do you need to provide more in there? So a barrage could help out. What else? Someone else with their hand up. I'll go to you next. Uh, massive TOT barrage. You can do a TOT barrage. Again, we got to take a look at what does a barrage really mean, right? So uh, one, I got to take a look at the structures inside the, the town. You know, how big is the, the, the environment? You know, when I say like the vertical environment, right? And then what is it I'm trying to achieve? You know, so there is a human domain of this. You know, we're out to murder people, right? But we are out there to make sure that we are able to seize terrain or objectives. Well, I was going to say, just refine it, right? During IPB, I pick out the likely strong points that I continue to refine that. Yep. Planning for fire in 24 hours before the breach, then probably starting 24 hours before that. I'm starting to layer all my hints to narrow that list. That's great. I would say it's critical on how we're integrating it with our direct fire and other means to put our enemy in, a, in multiple dilemmas. Yeah, so combined arms maneuver, right? Yeah, multiple dilemmas, multiple forms of contact. All right, the other thing is weaponeering, right? You know, so. A 155 round, okay, a 155 round, a normal 155, that includes Excalibur, right? Because it really is just a smart 155 round with a little bit less HE in it, right? Because you just really have an effects inside. A normal 155 round on an average building, so most of the buildings here, most of the buildings you see here constructed with on, on the top because the top's like, like a tank, is not as heavily reinforced because what happens if you have a, a bunch of heavy cement on top of a building, what would happen to the building, right? Comes structurally unstable, right? So if you look at this, when we talk about a normal HE round, it will penetrate about one floor, so the roof and a floor, right, and have effects on that floor, potentially a little bit, maybe a floor below based off spall and some other things, and of course there's concussive effects, all these other things we talk about. Uh, for a rocket or, a, you know, like a, so MRS, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what, what platform comes off of uh, an MRS, uh, um, or rock come up in MRS or high Mars, same, same weapon. Uh, it goes down about three floors, all right? It has effects on three floors, okay? And then uh, depending on the structure and the bomb type, 250 pound, 500 pound, 1,000, 2,000 pound bomb, they all have their own um, own effects and that's what the Air Force is paid to do. You just tell them the effect you want and they'll figure it out, right? And so we often talk about it. First, you know, you know the, good, the good thing is what I like about this particular thing here is we started to see units actually engage with fires inside of the city. One of the things we, also, we often talk about is rubbling buildings, dropping buildings, barrages. Okay, there are uses for that. We got to figure out when and where in a time and space. That's all through the risk versus reward, law of armed conflict, ROE, and the things that we mentioned earlier, targeting. All right, so those are all factors we got to take a look at. And that's really at the brigade commander level. It's no longer at the division level. All right, unless there's the ROE changes specifically for, for certain areas, whether well, it's a different country, who knows. But we'll take it in. ROE, law of armed conflict, proportionality, distinction, military necessity. Sir, uh, during this time, did you have civilian role players? And did you capture how many civilian casualties there were? So we do have civilian role players in this. Now, uh, I, I'll caveat this. So rotational design, you know, and so... If, if they attack early in the morning, like at two in the morning, we may not just because of, you know, it's, it's contractors, right? Uh, but yeah, we do account for civilians. I'm glad you brought that. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so we definitely account for that. Again, it's risk versus reward, right? So uh, as we, again, we take a look at this, we look at our commanders attend for fires, central fire support tasks, maintaining constant pressure tempo, you know, not just at the breach, not just the start of the fight, but, you know, a day, two days, three days, you know, maintaining that constant pressure to disrupt. You know, the, the one we did this in January and the last time we did this in May, uh, when they when the, where the two units actually provided fires inside of a, inside of Razish early, it was very disruptive, super disruptive to the BFB and the 802nd BTG that was in there. All right. And here, right here, the last thing I want to leave is how do you control the narrative? Very hard to do. Ukraine is really great at doing that right now, right? True or not, they're good at doing it. 
Right. I mean, you have an actor, a former actor or a former comedian as a president. He's good at doing that. Right. Social media networking. You know, the, he, he understands the nuances of public relations. This is what we need to. Can we, can we get a check on learning? Can he control the narrative? No. What can you do? Right. You can fight in the information space. For exactly. It. Who controls the narrative? The mob. The mob. They do. Because everybody, everybody has a phone, right? You see it out there. I was out there talking to a couple of people and like 90% of the people are out there on their phones having bad neck problems because they're doing, they're all going to go see a chiropractor later, right? You know, I think we're all going to, as kids get older, we're going to start being like this because we all look down, right? Here's why I say that, right? So everybody controls this, right? Because everybody is either a, a, a politician, right? Someone is a Supreme Court or a constitutional uh, lawyer, right? And they're not, right? You know, someone's a, a, the best quarterback in the league, but it's a Monday morning quarterback like me who sits on the couch like, you should have done that, right? Everybody else says that too, right? Soccer guys, you know what I'm talking about, right? So look, how do you control it? You don't. But you, get a, you gotta get out there early with the truth, right? And you gotta get out there early and often. All right. And so the other part to this is, and like you were saying, is how do we mitigate civilian casualties? All right. So, again, large scale combat operations. We're fighting a fight in an urban environment. Specifically, this is what we're talking about. Now, how do we control that? How do we minimize civilian casualties? All right. So uh, I was reading through the civic uh, book. You know, I think it's really great. It's got a lot of things that we do. Uh, in a targeting realm in a very rapid manner we do at, at a BCT level, like 72 hours is fairly rapid, sometimes 48 or 24 or within hours or minutes for dynamic strikes, right? For all my chiefs out there who are targeting, targeting warrants, please correct me if I'm wrong. You know, so how do we control this? How do we, how do we get the narrative out there? Well, we use PSYOPs, we use uh, civil affairs, we use uh, the networks, whether it's a human terrain, whether uh, our human network, radio, television, you know, leaflet drops are great, you know, but most people have a phone now, right? You know, some people have some digital means unless that gets cut, but uh, also hard to do, right? Cause you know, let's, let's face it, Starlink is still out there, all right? You know, then after that, it'll be Skynet and then we'll all be you know, fighting Terminator, all right? So thanks for the chuckle, at least someone got it, I appreciate that, <laughs> all right. I'll be here all day. He's got great hair too. Yeah, I know, right? I'll be here all day. Uh, I'll be here all day. Uh, yeah, so anyway, so how do we control this? How do, how do we get our narrative out there early and often, right? So do we, uh, again, it, it all depends on the commander's intent. If we're trying to attack in, uh, into, a, into a, an objective, do we, do we broadcast that? Maybe. Depends. Depends on the speed. Depends on the tempo. Depends on what we want to do. So that we've got to figure out ways to let the populace know, right? A lot of that you're going to see on the news anyway, right? The fight's going to happen. They're going to see it. Civilians don't want to be in the fight as much as any. They just don't want to be in the fight either. But some like to, right? Some want to go out there and grab a. We see in the Ukraine right now. Like you can see the Michigan militia will be out there. If someone fights, you know, the U.S. You know, somebody's going to be out there with a weapon. Someone's going to be in the way. Some, you know, so we've got to figure out how to get folks from one place to another, whether it's a humanitarian corridor, or I think someone brought it up earlier. I think uh, Jay Warrior yeah, was my Canadian buddy. He's out here running around somewhere, right? Like, talked about, like, how do you get them in a truck to move them out somewhere? Or post signs, leaflet drop, doesn't matter, social media, you know, the IG, Instagram, you name it, Twitter, you know, Hey, stay in your basement, stay in this area. Don't be in this area. You can say that to you blue in the face, but like Sahar said in her brief, not everybody's gonna do that. Well, that is, that's when we start looking at risk versus reward. And for planners, that's great. That's what you look at when we talk about co-dev and war gaming, you need to bring that up for a decision point for the commander or whoever that commander is on the ground, right? Sir, go ahead. So for planners, where in, we talk about uh, combined arms fighting. Yeah. My question to you is multi echelon fighting. So at yeah. this point, has have you seen brigades go back and ask to reduce, bring the CFL back, so that you can leverage other assets? Sure. Yeah. So the the CFL or the FSCO. Uh, the CFL. So FSCO passed that. Yeah. Because the division has a jagic, they can be sure. a little bit better dynamic fight. Yeah. So so. So great. So all the artillery nerds in the house besides me, correct me if I'm wrong, right? So there's the coordinated fire line, the CFL, right? So as we look at this, uh, the brigade has its own, right? The brigade, each brigade will have its own 
CFL, and they determine that. And divisions, we can put all those together and have a division CFL, right? But it depends on where we're at in time and space. You talk about those, those, these fire lines and whatnot, these coordination points and coordination lines. CFL is one of them. Um, but division can also have its own, right? So the division CFL can be a little bit further out. Doesn't mean you can't shoot past it as a brigade. Somebody's tracking. CFL is a CFL is a CFL. It's a permissive fire. Very permissive. Yeah. It just really delineates kind of like where the division is probably generally going to play. You can still shoot across it. FSCL? No. Very restrictive. Sir, go ahead. Oh, FSCLs are very restrictive. Yes, sir. The CFL is the C yes, CFL is very permissive. The FSCL is very restrictive. It's a consideration. Yeah, no, it's a consideration. I mean, good practice is to figure out a safe passage uh, and coordinate with the generic international um, safe passage and also attack by the adversary if you can. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, is a, it is an important consideration. You should not be, you know, should move your tank to the civilian uh, team or, you know, again, if you have information that can better enable them to find a better way so they know you're engaged and then in a tactical fight here, they should not go there. So I think that's what's important. Second, second battle, which I think really highlighted well, the CA team mechanic did a great job. Yeah. So they basically got second battle pollution, about 1,000 people were left in the city once they got them in here. What they did was they did whisper campaigns at CMOC. So um, basically, the CG would tell the MKMEs and Volusia, hey, you know what? A fight's coming eventually. And they did the drama about a week prior, and they didn't save time, but bottom line, a fight is coming. We got the hand, and they got out. Uh, and, and it works, right? You know, and it goes back to, again, we're, we're, you're not out to murder people, right? That's not what we do. It's not, it's not what we do. We're not, we're not some adversaries that we fight. We have to have ethical, some ethical morals that go with it. But with that being said, that's why we look at the law of armed conflict, ROE, necessity, distinction, proportionality. But at the end of the day, there's a fight that's happening, and it's hard to hit the pause button to get folks out of the way. Ideally, it's considered you do, you have a good plan for it. But again, tempo means something, right? And so we got to, we got to, it all goes into that sort of battlefield calculus. Ma'am. Um, I know, you know, AI is being looked at. And Brian, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. But uh, it's like, is there, when I've written about it in my report too, and trying to better understand, AI can be leveraged to analyze a lot of data, right? So uh, how can that be leveraged in our, you know, dense urban environment to see, to better assess where, adversary is located where you know civilians could be and is that a tool that has the, has the US started trying to use that to help in and I think maybe more for the dynamic than sure. uh, than uh, deliberate strike. Uh, you know I mean I you know, this is sort of my perspective I don't think it's the army's perspective right I mean I think it is uh, but I was talking from my perspective as you know Derek Barrett right uh, that that is the wave of the future right and, uh, and as we look at so like CTC and NTC you all talk about NTC specifically is uh, one of the things that we're looking at is how do you build this data lake, right? As General Taylor would put it, like this big data lake. You know, where's the enemy? What do they have their defense? What does that look like? What does the human train look like? The civilian corridor, where are the civilian pipes, what are they doing? You know, where, where do I see fire, the fire support plan? What is the, the typical um, objective that uh, we see the fight? Where, how do we see the AD, DTG and all the BTGs under the division tactical group, right? All the brigade tactical groups that we fight. So we're trying to build this data lake where AI can and then run this simulation. It's like a Monte Carlo simulation. Is anybody, anybody familiar with that? Right? So Monte Carlo simulation is where they get all your the running simulation of weather patterns, SDZs, all these other things. So we, we finish the thought. So we were talking about war games, right? Yeah. So if you if you could play this game, right, you play yes. it annually and you play it once, what happens if you played it a hundred thousand times or a million times in a computer in ten seconds? And it spits out and says, Well, yep. this plan worked 37 percent of the time or well this plan worked 94 percent of the time that make a difference right based on the inputs you're like well 37 percent sucks let's change the parameters yep. run that thing again and oh by the way when you ran it again oh this civilian thing just popped up whatever the computer pulls it all that data in runs it again a hundred thousand times in 10 seconds switch it back out that's what he's talking about yes, sir. no no it's really great and, and ideally what you do is this war game which is really great uh you have decision points and the program stops it says this is a decision you have to make 
And that allows you to look at the war game a different way, right? Because when we war game, what are we war game? A lot of it's based off CCIR, critical information requirements, decision points, right? You know, we take a look at that. So ideally, that's what the AI will allow you to do in the future. And part of that is the human terrain, right? Uh, that's part of it is part of the risk, risk decision. Again, risk decision versus reward, right? Risk versus reward. Okay. Um, my last slide is super easy. It's, this is a this is a fight into Razish. You know, as we look at a unit that came in uh, from the south side. Um, you know, so the most unit the last the last we saw they came into the north side. So again, we see unit coming through the Hidden Valley. They come and fight this fight. You can see Black Horse right here. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, well, you know, the 80, 802nd, right? Uh, in here, the BFB. You can see where they're out here doing a mobile defense, and they kind of collapse back into here. And then an infantry unit with strikers uh, doing a Sosra drill, right? Uh, so this unit here did a lot of that in the north and had a good fire support plan inside the town. This is typically all we see is a suppression, obscuration, secure, reduce assault. So a SOSRA drill, you know, for artillery, I call it a SO drill, suppression, obscuration. We see this and that's it. And then what we're doing is we're not providing constant pressure inside the city early and often, and we're not doing it while we're fighting street to street. So with this, you know, that's good. There's some good plan that goes along with this. Wonderful. But there's nothing that's happened here outside of maybe some direct fire engagements, and that's it. So planners, take a look at that. We're talking about the physical kinetic application of fires and fire support. We're talking about observation planning, we're talking about a target acquisition platform, down to attack delivery platform over a command and control network. Don't just do this, figure out how to fight this fight. Constant pressure, use an ROE, law of armed conflict, proportionality, distinction, and military necessity, right? with the right target engagement authorities at Echelon to fight this fight dynamically and deliberately. Simple. That will allow you to do this in a combined arms maneuver. Totally simple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with that being said, can do it. Yeah, if I could do it, and I am a caveman, anybody can do it, right? So I'm gonna turn it over to my good friend, Alex, uh, who he and I fought this same fight in 2019, brought it to JMRC in 2021, and we fought that fight. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 2021. No, uh, 2019 again, right? Or 2019, 2020. Oh, yeah. And then uh, then we linked back up at NTC, so. All right. Thank you, sir. As you said, Alex Bios, I'm the senior SEMA, reserve coach trainer at NTC. So a lot of people always ask me what SEMA stands for. Long acronym, sun, space, and electromagnetic activities. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, a lot of people ask what it means. So it's, it's such a long acronym that I couldn't even fit it uh, across the across the title there. Um, all right, so one thing I wanna do real quick is get back to your question. I don't wanna interject before, but uh, I think you were asking about AI more of like in the real world sense as opposed to the hypothetical. And there are a lot of things that are being done for that, uh, for AI and machine learning, such as like bots that can scrape, uh, because as we know now with social media, as we've seen in, you know, in Ukraine, Russia conflict, uh, there's a lot of uh, information intelligence that can be collected just from online, open source intelligence. Uh, but we don't have the personnel to filter through all that. Uh, so we are leveraging AI. Uh, like I said, for example, scraping bots that can go through hashtags and all that type of stuff on the social media. And that's actually one of our CG's uh, main uh, efforts in terms of redefining what reconnaissance is. Uh, for example, if we have Cav Scouts out at the front uh, that are trying to determine where is the enemy advancing from, uh, instead of putting them way out uh, where they're in, in harm's way, possibly putting their lives at risk, hard to resupply them, we can get that same information just by looking online and keep them out of harm's way. And uh, not only that, but those same cows cows can perform that uh, quote unquote intelligence function. It's not intelligence, it's just information gathering uh, because words mean things, but um, those same you know soldiers with all their uh, internet savvy that they have nowadays can help out with that reconnaissance. So it's, it's redefining what, what reconnaissance means. And as you guys um, recall, what they said when we visited NTC is they said that through that electronic recon, they're able to answer 80% of the enemy's PIRs. 80% of the enemy's PIR is about where the battalion talk is, where is everything located. 80% of that, they're getting it from open source. Yes, sir. 
All right, so SEMA is comprised of uh, three different areas. Uh, the cyber aspect, which itself has uh, three different uh, subdomains right here, offensive, defense, and then just net general maintenance of the network. And then what most people are familiar with, uh, electromagnetic warfare, you have the attack, the protection, the support, the support being the direction, finding, geolocation, that type of stuff. Uh, and then uh, someone over here had mentioned before the lunch break about, you know, how do we uh, uh, compare and contrast and deconflict between doctrine and, you know, some of these just... Uh, uh, a way type of methods and TTPs. You know, in the military, we have this uh, phenomenal resource uh, call where we publish a lot of lessons learned from NTC and, and a whole lot of TTPs. So I didn't want to put this in the pre uh, reading for the class because that's a whole lot of reading. But I highly recommend you look at uh, some of this to get smarter on SEMA because I'm just going to be covering wave tops here. Uh, a lot of good information in there for your staff to help out with planning when it comes to uh, SEMA operations. Uh, so that being said, too, just covering the wave tops, my last slide is going to be my contact information along with the rest of our SEMA team. I have two warrant officers and four NCOs, all very knowledgeable, a lot of operational experience. Uh, so we'd be happy to, uh, if you want to reach out to us at any time to ask for more information or whatever the case may be, please don't hesitate to do so. All right, so I'll start off with the, uh, the electromagnetic uh, warfare aspect. And the first subcategory of that is the protection. Now, this one is not so much... Uh, uh, specific to urban warfare, but it applies no matter where you are, uh, any environment uh, on the planet or even off the planet, some, you know, decades from now, maybe centuries, who knows. But anyway, um, so a big thing right now, emissions control and your PACE plan. So everybody's familiar with the PACE plan. Uh, MCON is a little bit newer of a concept, again, published in one of those call manuals that was on the previous slide uh, as a way. It's not doctrinal yet, uh, at least um, the example that we get in there, uh, which this is pulled out of that right there, it's sort of modeled after the uh, the DEFCON uh, system. That's, uh, that the DOD uses. Uh, so emissions control, again, that doesn't just mean, uh, you know, we need to go blackout on comms and nobody's going to talk and, you know, the commanders lose situational awareness. It's having a set plan as to when we're going to talk on certain systems and what sort of information is going to be passed over those systems uh, so that we reduce that electromagnetic footprint uh, so that, you know, those near-peer adversary systems that we, we all know about that are very potent at direction finding and geolocating based off of those signals, uh, they're, they're affecting this is reduced and they have less ability to target our our formations, especially our CPs, because uh, uh, CP uh, protection is, is, is very high right now on Freedom 6's list. For those of you that you don't know, that's the Force Comm Commander. Um, all right, so and that has to be coordinated with the pace plan, because uh, if the pace plan doesn't make sense with what's in your emissions control plan, then it's all just going to fall apart. Um, and then again, for planning for division of brigade levels, um, that starts back at home station. I would just like to echo what the general said earlier about getting punched in the face. Something that we're really bad at across the military is uh, putting that that sort of electronic warfare and cyberspace operations into our home station training uh, so we don't practice getting punched in the face from that aspect at all and then when we get to NTC what we see a lot is that the units just don't know how to react uh, when they get jammed and then the the chief of operations group has to say to the op four hey cut off the jamming it's just uh, detracting from their training too much uh, so for a planning perspective uh, that needs to start back at home station and ensure that that's integrated into your into your training and a lot of the times that it isn't done is because it's difficult it requires a lot of spectrum deconfliction you have to coordinate with the FAA because they get really paranoid about even if you're doing some GPS jamming that's only at one milliwatt which is less than the power in this laser pointer it only has effects for about one one kilometer but they're afraid that a plane's going to fall out of the sky and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard, uh, but your unit EWOs will do the work, and uh, you just have to enable them and encourage them to do that uh, so you can integrate that into your home station training. Uh, so again, with the MCON, there's a lot of stuff that has to be uh, put into that home station training. Again, it's understanding com comms discipline, uh, not just yakking on the, on, the, uh, on the microphone all the time, uh, having really planned reports. Um, a lot of people don't understand that with our digital systems like the JVCP and JCR, all those messages that everybody likes to have and, you know, everybody has their own little separate chat room inside the JVCP, um, that's all sending electrons out through the air and, um, at NTC, there is the Nest system that I'm sure that a lot of you have heard of that the Op4 uses and they are able to target the rotational training units, um, significantly uh, on their JCRs and JBCPs just off of this plethora of, of spectral information that's, that's being blasted out continuously on those systems. 
All right. So I think that is about all I'm going to cover here. I, sir. Uh, quick question. Has anybody tried bursting? Is, have you guys ever tried like turning it on, turning it off, only having it on to transmit and not having it on all the time? So, yes. What, what, what things have units tried successfully to reduce their EM signature, I guess I would say? So I, I'll talk about the fire, like from fire, 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 radar, we have queuing schedules, right? Mm -hmm. So the outpour is pretty good. Uh, so home station, they did some testing. It takes about two seconds to find you in the spectrum. It's not hard. So whether you're queuing or it's, 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 it's really, it's how do you reduce the bubble to make it that you're not the, like a viable target, right? So for fire, fire, radar, it's not hard to find at all. As soon as they, as soon as they block in the spectrum, they're easily found. That's in the fire portion, but for the, like a CP set, uh, it might be a little bit different. Yeah, for CP, honestly, sir, we haven't really seen anything very effective. I mean, uh, some units uh, actually do come with an MCON plan, uh, but then what happens is they don't execute it, and uh, it just sort of gets forgotten about. It gets buried in an annex somewhere, in the SEMA annex usually, or maybe uh, the signal annex. Uh, but it also doesn't get rehearsed back at home station, because when you have an MCON plan, it has to have buy-in from the brigade commander, and it has to be utilized... Um, equally uh, by all the subordinate units. Uh, they can't be on different phases of the MCON plan because uh, then they won't be able to communicate with each other or through echelons. Okay. Uh, so, so it just doesn't get practiced. something that did work, what would be a thing <laughs> to reduce um, emissions? Or to, what would be an effective thing that we could do to, re to reduce our emissions? Yes, sir, just Not for example. Like, can run. Sure, like with the JBCP, JCR thing, just turning off the transceivers and say we're only going to turn them on once every half hour or something like that. Um, we'll bring them back up just to ensure that the PLI, uh, position locator uh, indication information, uh, gets populated so we can have that situation awareness of where units are and then all the messages that need to go out, go out uh, and get received and then they get turned back off. Uh, so it's just more like that burst type of transmission that you're talking about, sir. Yeah, so that's that's one of the main areas that we can do that with. Yes, sir, and to be fair, um, our, our, the op four and the Russia, you know, our adversaries are really bad at this as well. I mean, uh, I, I can either see Lemon ACR, Black Horse in the spectrum, because they vlog a lot with their nest or their, mm -hmm. or their counter fire radars. And everybody's seen Russia, they are just, they're just emitting on every spectrum, not hard to find. So, uh, you know, it, we have to do better at it. And again, we talked about this yesterday, you weren't here yet, but how do you harden your network? One is make sure the passwords are set. You know, the right, the, the right, you know, emission control, the electromagnetic spectrum control. Because uh, Black Horse has a, a phenomenal task force reaper that'll break in the system fairly quickly. That's right. And that's a good point, sir, too, because I didn't mention this right here, GPS. We see most units come through to NTC and they don't have encryption in their daggers. And of course, as we know, you know, our near peer adversaries are going to jam GPS. So uh, if you have the encryption in there, it doesn't mean that you can't be jammed. It just means that uh, you're you're more resistant to that jamming. You can go further into that jamming environment and maintain your GPS links. Uh, so that's, that's a simple thing that everybody should be doing that most units don't do. And then lastly, it's just uh, using like directional antennas. And that this is the one point right here that I think is more pertinent to urban warfare, because uh, as you're in the cities, you're going to need to use more uh, directional antennas to maintain communications uh, between, you know, if you're looking, if you're in a skyscraper type of environment, you have to maintain communications with another platoon that's a, a few miles down uh, a highway, then you might be better off using directional antennas, but also as a benefit, uh, that reduces your footprint, because you, as you can see here, when you use our omnidirectional antennas, it's just a big giant bubble where the enemy uh, SIGINT or, or EW uh, assets might be able to detect your emissions, whereas you're using a, a directional antennas, uh, they will be less likely to be able to detect that. Uh, question? How much energy do you think it takes to jam one of our systems? Isn't that jammer <coughs> lighting up and could light themselves up? It is, it is. Absolutely. So one of the reasons, uh, so Colonel Byrd was saying that, you know, our, our adversaries are just as bad at emissions as we are. But the reason why it's so difficult for us is because they have much, much greater capability in terms of their ground equipment that's been fielded. They put a lot more emphasis on this over the last, you know, 30 years. Uh, so they have 
much greater uh, capability uh, on their ground forces, like I mentioned, than we do. Uh, one of the uh, websites that I did have for the pre-reading for the class was all the technology that, that the Army's working on fielding for electronic warfare and SIGINTS. And it all sounds awesome and all that, but it's been in the works for years, almost decades at this point, and it's probably going to be years before we actually see it proliferated throughout the force. So unfortunately, we, we don't really have parity with our near peers on, on that. So that's, that's why it's uh, such a point of emphasis on reducing our signature right now. Yeah. All right. Next slide. Let's see. All right. EW support. So this is where we're direction finding and geolocating, just like that. Uh, one of the considerations I just mentioned right now, the fact that we don't have a lot of organic capabilities, so we need to rely on uh, EAB, echelons above brigade, things like the growler and the compass call, and also the SIGINT platforms like rivet joint and all that kind of stuff like that. Um, Doing reverse IPB in the planning process is really essential for specialty MOSs like myself to help out the S2 because they have enough planning to do as it is just for the maneuver force. So all those other specialty MOSs really need to help out the S2 to get a, a good enemy picture. And then of course you have your METC considerations as well. So you have terrain uh, in the urban environment. You're gonna have a lot of skyscrapers. Those signals that you're trying to find are gonna refract and diffract and bounce all over buildings, which is gonna make it harder uh, to figure out where they're coming Coming from, uh, but on the positive side, if you're the one that's in the urban environment and defending, for example, uh, that will make it harder for the enemy, even with all their very capable ground systems, to determine exactly where your signals are coming from, right? Um, so, for example, here you have your transmission site and your receive site, and it's not going direct straight line. Those signals are bouncing off buildings, down streets and all that to get to where they need to go. So it's going to be harder to direction find where it came from originally. And then of course, this is uh, Manila right here. So, and a lot of these examples we've been using, you know, Razish or, or smaller towns like that, uh, like Major Giroux had. But uh, if, you're, if you're talking about Manila, uh, where you have millions of people and uh, Razish might be the size of like this one neighborhood right here, for example. Um, so finding signals is going to be a lot harder. A lot of people say that, you know, we're using military signals that are specific, obviously to the military, different from civilians. So it'll be re really easy to find, but that's not necessarily true when you have just millions of signals out there and you're trying to find one specific signal. Even if you know what that signal is, it'll still be really hard to find it. Um, and that depends on the strength of the signal, the sensitivity of the thing that's trying to find that signal, and everything that's physically in between those two uh, in terms of the terrain, again, as I mentioned there. So those are just considerations uh, when you're trying to either find the enemy via ELINT or SIGINT or, or, or EW or be hidden from the, the, the enemy uh, in those regards. So. EA, all the sexy stuff that everybody wants to talk about. Again, uh, this is where I'm going to circle back to what, where Colonel Baird was talking about. So um, I should have put this at the top, but organic versus EAB. So organic, you know, you're going to be able to utilize your assets whenever you want. Um, EAB, not so much, right? Because you're going to have very limited uh, assets in theater, those growlers, those compass calls, or whatever the platform may be for our, you know, our foreign partners and allies. Um, so, and depending again on the priority of support, you might not have but a couple of hours on station that are allocated to your unit, you know, maybe four at best. Um, to where you get that on station providing the effects that you want over the area that you want. So that really has to go into your planning consideration of like, what is the critical time that I need this platform on station doing what I need it to do? Um, and your organic capabilities, again, uh, you, even though you can use them whenever you want, uh, just like the point was made, when they turn on and they start jamming, they're gonna be blaring a big signal. So you don't wanna be doing that all the time because you don't want the enemy to find out you know, those, uh, those limited assets that you have and destroy them. So maybe it's best to use it you know, during the breach, during that, uh, that suppression and obscuration. I like to call EA digital suppression and obscuration because uh, you're suppressing the enemy's ability to talk, which reduces their ability to coordinate a defense or a counterattack. Um, and then you're just you're digitally obscuring them, right? So layer those effects uh, with uh, with that actual obscuration fires, um, and then also depending on the environment and how 
what, what type of capabilities your, your enemy has, you might be able to start that ahead of time with conditioning or herding. This is something that we use a lot in the coin fight. So conditioning is where you jam like at a certain hour every day, you know, at 1400 to 1800, you've got your compass call jamming, flying around and the enemy's like, ah, oh, they're jamming our cell phones again. Every day they do this at this time. And then they get used to it. And then on day 10, that's when you hit them and they're not expecting it. They just think it's routine, right? Or herding where you're trying to, uh, get information, you know, from the intelligence standpoint, you, uh, you jam them on their cell phones and it forces them to have to use their, their alternate form of communication, which might be uh, a handheld walkie talkie, which is not encrypted. And then all of a sudden now your, your Intel, your SIGINT, your ELINT, your EW are able to uh, listen in on those conversations and hear what they're doing, hear what they're planning, uh, makes it easier for you to find out uh, what they want to do. So I talked about the key, moment, the key moments, like in the seizure of an objective, that's when you want to synchronize with other effects. Uh, and again, going to the messaging, controlling the narrative, uh, you got to coordinate with all those other IRCs, civil affairs, psyops, public affairs, too, um, to ensure that ahead of time, you you message to those civilians to hey go this way not that way because if you go that way you're going to run into us and you're going to hinder us from from helping you we're here to help you controlling a narrative ahead of time um, and then also you know preventing and preventing fratricide electronic electromagnetic fratricide absolutely so the sir is trying to put out a big message and you're jamming everybody what's the point right for sure. Yes, absolutely. That is a definite consideration. I'm glad you mentioned that, sir. Uh, and then if, if, you know, in the event that we do have to withdraw or retrograde, whatever, you can, you can jam again, uh, sort of like, you know, firing smoke again to suppress your, your movement back. Same thing. Uh, emergencies, if you have a fallen angel, you don't want the enemy to be able to coordinate uh, and get there before you get there, that type of stuff, like a Black Hawk, Black Hawk Down situation. Uh, so some of those are a lot of the considerations just on, on a real quick basis uh, for, for EA. And then, okay, so SEMA, for the last 20 years, everybody thinks that it's just, you know, counter ID and that's it. Uh, it's not, and as I just briefed, it's so much more than that. But uh, that being said, it's important that we don't forget all the lessons learned uh, from that because, you know, in an urban environment, obviously IEDs are still gonna be a factor. Um, so remembering how to use those systems um, and not losing that knowledge is very important. But that being said, it's also important to remember that it's uh, counter RCID, radio controlled. Um, SEMA is not gonna be able to do anything against pressure plate, command wire detonated, uh, IEDs, that type of thing. Thing. So just RCID. And along with that same note, um, EW is used a lot for seed, right? Um, for jamming those uh, target acquisition and target tracking radars, ADA radars, right? Uh, but it's important to remember that uh, you can't jam man pads, right? So we all, always have a lot of units that come through at NTC and they end up getting their TAC aviation shot down, for example. And they say, well, why did we get that shot down? We had growl on our station, we had compass call on station, whatever, but there's still a man pad threat out there. Uh, so, but what can you do from an electronic warfare, uh, electromagnetic warfare standpoint uh, to, to mitigate this threat? Threat, and I have my Black Hawk uh, down clip right here. So you remember where uh, the, the helicopters went out and you had the kid out here with the cell phone and then he relayed to another kid and that kid called the warlord and all that. So what you can do is, hey, let's jam those cell phone signals, right? So that they're not able to communicate and then that way that reduces the likelihood of getting shot down by one of these things right here. Sir. I just want to clarify, you can't do anything about man pads. That's what you said. Not from an electronic warfare standpoint. So we, we can't jam them. That's just, uh, it's line of sight, EOIR tracked, right? So we, we can't jam them, sir. All right. And uh, well, so going back to this, so we can do, we can jam cell phones via, you know, classic EW, right? Jamming the signal. But you can also, you know, affect the cell phone networks and you can do that via cyber. And there's a lot more that you can do with cyber. So again, going back to those urban warfare considerations, there are things called uh, SCADA networks that control like rail lines and things like that. Uh, power plants use them, all kinds of stuff like that. So if you want to turn off a power plant and shut down the, you know, the, the power to a certain sector of the city, you know, think about cyber capabilities. If you uh, want to do, um, 
sur sub subterranean considerations, right? Uh, somebody had mentioned about like flooding those those underground facilities. Well, you can also just turn off the ventilation to those facilities, and then that'll force everybody that's in there. It's like, okay, we're we're running out of air. We got to come out. They come out waving their white flags, hopefully. Um, and again, the 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 point is not to kill people, not to you know suffocate you know thousands of people, but just force them to come up out of there without you having to go in there. Um, with that extra risk. So as long as the J crop is a cyber, because I, I will tell you a lot of folks think it's like that. And I, I don't think it is. It's not, yes, sir. And yeah. I was going to get to that. But so there are certain capabilities that um, the thing to remember, again, planning consideration for cyber is that you have these tools that some of them are more like a, a durable tool and some of them are more like a surgeon's scalpel where it's like, you know, very precise, but then you use it once and you got to throw it away. You're not going to be able to use it again. Uh, so a lot of these tools are already available to you when you get in the theater as a brigade commander, division commander, you should be, you know, getting your brief uh, from those stow and sap capabilities capabilities, uh, get right on to all that, and you'll get a, like a sushi menu of what you can do or what you can't do uh, in theater. Um, so those, those capabilities will be pretty readily available to you, and it should be just a few days, almost within like a standard targeting cycle of 72 hours, you know, for, for fires, that type of thing. But if you're requesting a special capability that, that hasn't been developed, then it could take weeks, maybe even months uh, for some just really smart, uh, you know, keyboard uh, commandos to come up with the code to do whatever it is that you're asking them to do, right? So, um, and then for example, we can use Cyber to disrupt those uh, integrated fire control nets uh, for their their indirect fires or you know their ADA systems, whatever the case may be. A lot of that times it's gonna require close access though, like somebody special forces getting in there with a thumb drive or a CD and uploading some code into their system, kind of like happened you know, with Stuxnet and whatnot a few years back. Um, so yeah, that is Cyber. Can I just uh, mention? Yes, ma'am. And again, as you very as you laid out over there, these are dual use facilities, right? So they sure. the cyber when they end by the military and the civilian. So the legal advisor will very heavily involved Oh absolutely your um, power grids and hospitals offline. Right. And and that's I'm glad you said that. That's another consideration. That is involved with that. So sure. Before, I mean, even the US and this is public knowledge, not that I have access to any classified obviously, but even whenever when the U.S. has conducted a cyber attack, mm -hmm. uh, it's gone up very high level. To yes, yes, that is true. You know, for example, that IED factory. Like yeah, like, like the IED factor that we were talking about and before, if you wanted to cut off the power to that for whatever reason, but maybe on that same power grid, there's also a hospital like she just mentioned. So you have to like plan for that and talk to the legal team, talk to PAO and, and weigh those risk versus reward type stuff. Uh, always with the civilian considerations for, for cyber, especially. Uh, let's see. So this is a, a product that was developed by the, the Cyber Center of Excellence. It's not on uh, call or Army Publishing Directorate. Unfortunately, they just distributed through their own channel, so not a lot of people know about it. But I think it's a really good product, so that's why I put it in the slide deck. I'm not going to go into it because running short on time, but it's there if you want to look at it. And then, um, well... Looks like my last slide, maybe it was hidden or something like that, but I promise you it's in there. It's my contact information, the rest of my team. Uh, I know this was really quick and dirty, but um, again, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any more questions about uh, anything SEMA related. Appreciate your time.